October 23, 2002, 50 Chechen terrorists burst into a Moscow theater and seized 800 hostages. Armed with explosives, the terrorists announced a single demand, the withdrawal of all Russian troops from Chechen territory. After days of fruitless negotiation, Russian President Vladimir Putin gave the order for special forces to reclaim the theater by storm. The decision was also made to use what most Western analysts think was fentanyl, uh, an opiate non-lethal gas, in conjunction with the assault. The objective being to render the Chechen rebels incapable of resistance while the hostages were rescued. The tactic worked. The drug-dazed criminals were overcome without triggering a horrific series of blasts. But there was a tragic side effect. High levels of the opiate gas caused the deaths of 116 innocent captives. Sometimes when you're uh, in war or you're involved in situations such as that the Russians confronted, there are no good choices. Then you need to look at what options you do have available, go through the choices of use of lethal force, what your non-lethal options are, and again, select that that is the best given the alternatives, but it may not be a good one. While the loss of innocent life in the Moscow episode was extraordinary, the dilemma that confronted the police and military forces involved was not. Police and peacekeeping troops are often faced with the problem of having to apprehend criminals without hurting the innocent. Both in hostage situations and when combating rioters. An increasingly viable option in these situations is a growing arsenal of devices that can subdue without causing death. The military designation for these weapons is non-lethal. However, most police agencies step back from that characterization and are more comfortable referring to the technology as less than lethal or just less lethal. The law enforcement community refers to it as less lethal because any of these products, um, if misused or used improperly, um, can cause serious injury and or death. Labels aside, new weapons like shock devices, chemical agents, and directed energy beams now offer a variety of technologies both police and military peacekeeping troops can use to fill the gap between shouting and shooting. They are especially useful when confronting mobs in which nonviolent individuals are mixed in with criminals. People that are in a, a mob uh, are not homogenous in their degree of emotions and commitment. There's usually a, a group of very hardcore agitators and then a lot, there's a lot of people just simply watching. You might be operating in an area where some folks live. They're just there by an act of geography. On the other hand, you may have folks who mean to do harm, the threat, and they might move into that area. Again, how do you separate them out? How do you control the crowd in as, as non-lethal a way as possible? Perhaps the most widely used method for dealing with these situations to date has been the non-lethal projectile. As early as the 4th century BC, foot soldiers made use of a device many consider to be one of the first non-lethal projectiles. The multi-pointed, hand-grenade-sized Caltrop. Caldrop was nothing more than several pieces of, of metal welded together in, in a form of a triangle that could be thrown out so that the enemy cavalry couldn't close with you because a horse's hoof is very, very soft. And by putting a caldrop in there, you could keep the cavalry at arm's length. But it wasn't until the modern era that projectiles specifically designed to arm rather than kill appeared. And they were firearms based. The guard round was one of the first. Dating from the early 20th century, the guard round was used by the U.S. military for a brief time as a sort of safeguard against friendly fire. A lot of times when a, a guard's on duty, you know, they're asked to serve uh, a shift of a number of hours in the middle of the night in cold weather. And a guard round was designed so that if in case, you know, a friendly was mistaken for uh, for an enemy that you wouldn't be doing lethal harm to, to someone on your own side. The guard round had the standard components of a rifle cartridge, a primer, propellant, and a copper-clad projectile. 
but the casing was fluted to accommodate much less gunpowder. Make no mistake, it could be lethal, uh, you know, in close distances, uh, if it hit the individual in a, you know, an inappropriate spot. But its general use was designed to give a report when the gun was fired and to uh, deliver a projectile with stunning power but not enough power to uh, cause traumatic damage. A decade later, at the height of the Great Depression, a common household product, rock salt, fired from a shotgun, emerged as an ultra-low tech, yet quite effective, non-lethal projectile for use against vagrants. There were literally armies of homeless men in search of work that were traveling the country on, on rails, uh, you know, just hiding in boxcars. And a lot of people, especially the they used to call the train dicks in the railroad yard, began using rock salt and shotguns as a means of being able to dispense uh, a threatening level of force without doing great bodily harm. But the projectiles we think of as non-lethal today, rubber, plastic, and wooden bullets, didn't come into initial use until the 1960s. British colonial troops in Hong Kong used them first. By 1967, British forces had begun the practice of fending off anti-colonial protesters by firing long wooden bullets called baton rounds. Made of teak wood, these rounds were seven inches long, an inch and a half in diameter, and were fired from flare guns. And what they would normally try to do is aim that in front of a crowd so that it would hit and skip into them about knee height. The idea here was to cause a lot of pain uh, not to kill anybody. The problem, however, was that the wooden rounds occasionally skipped too high and hit people in the head. The result could be fatal. By the 1970s, the British had modified the baton round concept and were firing rubber projectiles, the first rubber bullets. Used mainly against protesters in Northern Ireland, these projectiles were shorter but more aerodynamic than their wooden predecessors. It doesn't have a lot of weight to it, maybe six ounces or so. It's aerodynamic. It'll, it'll go a good 50, 60, 100 yards and still pack some foot-pounds of force when it hits. Indeed, with a muzzle velocity of 200 miles an hour, these large projectiles, even though they were rubber, could still be deadly if fired at a range of less than 25 yards. In recent years, while the potential hazards of using rubber bullets haven't changed, the technology itself has transformed dramatically. The generic term rubber bullet now encompasses a wide range of non-lethal projectiles. From canvas beanbags filled with lead shot, to small foam and wooden batons, pin stabilized rounds, and small plastic pellets. Some of these projectiles, the beanbag in particular, can cause severe blunt trauma to the human body. Indeed, in its initial square design, the beanbag occasionally caused death. Meant to tumble through the air, this teabag-shaped projectile would occasionally catch the wind and fly like a frisbee. Upon impact, its sharp edges would slice through the skin of a suspect, causing internal injury. New bean bags are in the form of a pouch, so there are no sharp edges, but the projectile still has a punishing impact, which often allows it to play a crucial role in day-to-day -day law enforcement. An unarmed suspect, for instance, is very difficult to justify the use of a beanbag. But an armed suspect, and I'll just give you two examples, knives and clubs, very, very common weapons that we encounter every day, both of which are lethal if you get hit with one of those. Both of which, though, you have to close with the suspect before they become effective. To the degree that these things allow us to intervene without closing with the suspect, they're very, very appealing. Still, the beanbag's minimum safe distance is 25 feet. An alternative projectile that's safe at ranges as short as five feet is a 40 millimeter sponge tipped round called the exact impact. Originally developed by the military for use in peacekeeping operations, the sponge round has undergone extensive trials. 
like this test on soft ballistic clay to measure the round's effects on a human body. The projectile uses a high-density foam nose with a polycarbonate body. Once the foam nose impacts the target, it has the ability to crush and deform slightly. So you reduce blunt trauma and spread the impact area evenly across the target. Defense Technology Federal Laboratories in Wyoming licensed the concept from the military and now produces the sponge round for use in law enforcement. And what we do is we take their projectile that was designed and we uh, incorporate it with our smokeless propulsion system. The core of that propulsion system is a blank 38 caliber pistol round, much like the blank rounds used in starter guns. Using a pistol cartridge rather than loose gunpowder in the base of the sponge round allows for tighter control over the projectile's performance. So we're able, from a quality control standpoint, to regulate the velocity of the projectile when it strikes a, a human target within probably about 5 to 10 feet per second. While bean bags, plastic pellets, and sponge rounds have seen widespread use, not all non-lethal projectiles are propelled by firearms. Some reach their targets through other means, and a few deliver overwhelming force. The concept isn't exactly new. In fact, the technology's been around since the 1950s. But the water cannon has always worked as well or better than any other crowd-dispersing weapon that's ever been devised. And versions of it, like this Rhino crowd control vehicle, are still in use today. The Rhino has a water tank of approximately 2,000 gallons. And basically, it shoots out in continuous or pulsing mode, the water can itself, at 100 to 250 PSI, at 150 to 250 GPM, gallon per minute, and the outreach can go as high as 250 feet. At a pressure of 200 pounds per square inch, a water cannon jet can bruise a person's skin. But typically, the jet simply causes a rioter to turn away before any damage takes place. The Rhino's water cannon is multi-directional, and it's controlled remotely from a panel within the vehicle's protected interior. It's state-of-the-art technology, yet it's merely the latest version of a concept born in New York Harbor decades ago. Water cannons were originally on fireboats and were used to put out fires on ships. Occasionally, they'd knock sailors off their feet. This happened repeatedly, and eventually somebody said, look, this is a great idea. Why don't we create a vehicle that does this thing on a, a long-term basis in other situations? During the turbulent 1960s, police often used water to put down riots and disperse demonstrators. And the tactic is still used in Europe, Canada, and elsewhere today. But in recent decades, the practice has fallen out of favor in the United States. This may be the result of negative public perception. For many Americans, the idea of using water cannons conjures painful images of police using fire hoses against participants in civil rights marches. The use of a water cannon is still considered rather taboo here and the police in general are not quite ready to use it as long as civil liberty is a fundamental fabric of our society. As a result, crowd control vehicles like the Rhino are sold primarily overseas. Most countries in South America, Africa, Middle East, as well as in China, Indonesia, and many others in the Far East do have these vehicles and they do use them. While the social unrest of the 1960s, both civil rights marches and student protests against the Vietnam War, may have spelled the end for the water cannon in America, this same unrest helped spur research and development that over time resulted in many of the non-lethal crowd control weapons used today. One technology developed in recent years, and one that has seen widespread use, is the sting ball grenade. Sting ball is the bread and butter of riot, modern riot control. <laughs> and basically what it is, it's a explosive device that uses a powder inside that bursts. And when it does, it throws these hard rubber balls. And so people get hit. 
but they don't get hit with, with a, enough velocity or enough mass or with hard enough projectiles to cause serious injuries. Sting ball grenades are especially useful during riots in which violent agitators are hiding behind crowds of innocents. A lot of the agitators are throwing rocks and bottles at us or other people from behind other things, cars, vehicles, and most often other people, which means that we don't have the ability of isolating this group and leaving the people in between us alone. In these cases, sting ball grenades are ideal. Police can lob them over the heads of the crowd and target agitators directly. But while instruments like the sting ball grenade and water cannon are useful for driving violent groups away from an area, sometimes the objective is to apprehend individuals. This calls for a non-lethal projectile that can immobilize its targets. One such device that looks like something from a cartoon is the webshot net gun. Borrowing a concept long used in non-lethal animal control, the net gun is fired from the shoulder and propels multiple weights that pull with them a section of netting 10 feet wide. The weights separate in flight, expanding the net to completely engulf and entangle an individual. But a more common incapacitating device carried by police is the taser. The taser looks and shoots like a pistol, but rather than using blunt impact projectiles to disable suspects, it uses electricity. And as this volunteer in a police training course can attest, it's extremely effective. The taser fires two metal darts, which remain connected to the weapon by electrical wires. When the two darts touch, they have a, a probe on them, or a, a little a barb, that penetrates the skin, and then as soon as they do that, it sends an electrical shock. The shock, which initially lasts five seconds and can be repeated with an additional trigger pull, interferes with the brain's ability to send correct impulses to the muscles. Most suspects shot by a taser fall down immediately. And since the taser can incapacitate without discharging loose projectiles, it may soon become standard equipment in the cockpits of commercial airliners. As a safeguard against hijackings, the Department of Transportation is considering allowing airline pilots to arm themselves with tasers while in flight. Rubber bullets, sting ball grenades, electrical shockers. They'll all get the job done. But in the realm of non-lethal weapons, subduing a violent individual or dispersing a crowd doesn't always require the force of projectiles. Sometimes, a really bad smell is force enough. NASCAR has its roots in prohibition. Guys raced for bragging rights, but made their living outrunning the feds. There were more hot rods hauling unpacked liquors. Hey, shot me. And you can shake a stick at it. Moonshine Cars on Automaniac with Bill Goldberg. Tomorrow at 10 on the History Channel. Who's up for Outback? With Call Ahead Seating, just call up, get on the list, and satisfy your Outback craving faster. Measles is a game you play and then you sing a song. Mumps are something that camels have. Some have two mugs and some have one. Chicken Park is a park where chickens have fun. Most kids today don't have a clue about diseases adults remember, thanks to Merck scientists. We've invested billions to research heart disease and asthma. Now we're trying to make Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer history, too. Merck, where patients come first. There's nothing like the exhilaration of finding the love of your life. Hard to describe, but it's beautiful. Are we really this much in love with each other? Are we just crazy? She completely sees me for who I am. And our cheeks hurt every time we talk. We <laughs> smile a lot. <laughs> you deserve to be deeply loved for who you are. And at eHarmony, it's possible. It begins with our comprehensive personality profile. A $40 value, yours free. It's never too early to be happy for the rest of your life. eHarmony.com. Log on today. Hey, looks like you got that Ranger fully loaded. Almost. 
Man, you got that F-150 all tricked out. Not quite. You got everything on that tough Ford Super Duty. Just about. Now I do. Get any built Ford Tough truck and choose a premium gift package from the Home Depot at no extra charge. America's number one selling truck line just got better. Bring it home. Ford. Built Ford Tough. Sensitive teeth? Before, you only had toothpastes. Now, Aurigel introduces Advanced Tooth Desensitizer. Only Aurigel is FDA cleared to relieve sensitivity at home in just one day. Last up to a month. Aurigel. Swab it on. Sensitivity gone. One day, you wake up and find a few hairs on your pillow. Next day, they're dribbling your head down the court. Get V for Men Thickening Shampoo for up to 50% thicker looking hair for better scalp coverage. V for Men by L'Oreal Paris. I'm having work done. And I'm so excited. Let Olay Regenerous do the work. It continuously renews skin's appearance at the cellular level for lasting results. Olay Regenerous. Work done. With our valve, there is water. And where there's water, there's life. With our mask, there's air to breathe. And where there's air, there's a rescue. With our syringe, there's a safe injection. And with that, there's hope for a cure. At Tyco, we make thousands of products that aren't simply important. They're vital. Tyco, a vital part of your world. Broadband, you're ready to go. Visit Vonage.com or call 1-800-928-4VON. Now available at Best Buy, Circuit City, and Buy.com. We now return to non-lethal weapons on Modern Marvels. We all know these are non-lethal weapons. But what about this? A simple smell. You want to have a seat here? And as you can see, there's a computer screen in front of you. That's what you're going to use to make your responses about how intense you think the odor is and whether you like it or whether it's irritating. Pam Dalton of the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia is preparing to administer an odor research test. She's been asked by the Department of Defense to conduct some exploratory research on malodors, bad smells. Her task in recent months has been to find odors that could be repulsive to anyone, independent of experience or cultural background. That's really bad. That which is produced biologically is more likely to be universal. So we concentrated on many of the smelly effluents from the human body. Vomit, underarm sweat, foot sweat, feces, you name it, we, we had all of them. Some of the resulting concoctions include flavors like bathroom malodor stock, burned hair, and stench soup. There is, as it turns out, some historical precedent for the use of malodors as non-lethal weapons. Back in World War II, there was an attempt to make a very smelly concoction called Humi. This was initially intended to be sent to the resistance in France and they would then spray it upon the German officers that were occupying Paris at the time and I presume to either mark them because these odors can be persistent and will stay on your clothes for some time or to just embarrass them but I don't have any evidence that it actually was successful in being implemented in the way that it had been originally intended. Since part of her mandate is to find odors that are universally offensive, Dalton has traveled extensively to conduct cross-cultural testing of all types of smells. Sprouting fish, all right. <laughs> the Japanese tend to be much more fond of odors that come from fish that are a little off or a little, a little old, let's say, a little fermented, and the Germans don't like that at all. But then there are other odors that have to do with, say, rye or caraway that the Germans are incredibly fond of and the Japanese weren't. Other findings were quite surprising. One of the odors I took that is very 
people in America are very fond of is cinnamon. We use it in lots of products, baking, candies, things like that. And when I was testing cinnamon in South Africa, particularly among black South Africans, they were completely unfamiliar with it. They had never smelled it. They didn't use it in cooking. And because of its pungency, they thought it was dangerous. They hated it. It's precisely that common fear of unfamiliar smells that authorities want to exploit through the use of odor weapons. <sighs> One potential use of a strange odor, some feel, could be as a means of clearing a public building during a bomb threat. You can look through the press every day. Somewhere in this country, someone is evacuating a building because one person smells something and all of a sudden there's a mass panic and people start to leave because they think potentially there's a dangerous gas involved. Releasing a chemical odor into the air conditioning system of an international airport, for instance, could be a non-language specific signal to vacate. Another potential use of odors, repulsive odors in this case, could be as a means of denying areas to rioters. Keeping looters out of buildings during the Los Angeles riots of 1992 was a challenge for police. We had the ability of taking some of these buildings back, but we didn't have the ability of holding them. And there was a, a natural reluctance of risking our troops to take buildings back that then we were going to surrender to the rioters in a few minutes anyway. This malodorant could go in there, and I'll tell you, only the most determined agitator would even consider going in to loot that place because you have to want the stuff out of that building really bad. And we may have ruined the merchandise, but we would have saved the structure and we lost a lot of the structures. While serious research into the field of malodorous chemicals may be new, the idea of using other types of less than lethal chemicals against an adversary is virtually as old as warfare itself. The Chinese were known to take red pepper and grind it up and throw it in the face of their enemies. You could also make use of a smoke by burning grasses. Certain grasses, when you burn them, give off really noxious fumes. The problem with that, of course, was you had to be real careful because if the wind was in the wrong way, you really had no protection against your own weapon and you could end up blinding yourself rather than blinding the enemy. So these things worked, but they didn't work real well. Today, while they're no longer used in warfare, some non-lethal chemicals have found a home in law enforcement. The substance used most commonly by police throughout much of the 20th century was tear gas. The term tear gas can actually refer to one of two chemical agents chloracetophenone, abbreviated as CN, or O-chlorobenzilidine melanontrol, more commonly known as CS. We obviously uh, abbreviate those because of the long chemical uh, names, but the, the term tear gas is actually a misnomer. These products are not actually gases, they're actually crystallins, much like a salt, if you will. These crystallins are solid in form and are embedded in a pyrotechnic fuel mixture. When the mixture burns, it creates a smoke that acts as a carrier agent. The CS or CN crystallins attach themselves to the smoke and are transported to the target. Deployed by grenade or aerosol spray, tear gas causes severe eye, skin, and respiratory tract irritation. But in most cases, it's not deadly. Since the 1930s, it's been one of law enforcement's weapons of first resort for dispersing crowds and clearing buildings. But it has its drawbacks. You can fight through the pain, or if you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you can fight through it. The other aspect is that individuals often can build a tolerance to this if you're exposed to it. Once you're exposed to it, you know how to deal with it. Veteran protesters have been known to pick up CS gas grenades and fling them back at police. Another problem is that it's very contaminating. If you sprayed a suspect, uh, even if it worked and you put him in your car, the rest of the night you drove around smelling CS spray. Uh, and the other thing is, is that it didn't metabolize instantaneously. And as a result of that, the guy had anywhere from 10 or 12 seconds at a minimum where it was no effect on target and he could continue doing whatever he was doing. In the early 1980s, the answer to many of these problems arrived in the form of O.C. 
oleoresin capsicum, more commonly known as pepper spray. Its effects are more immediate and intense than those of tear gas. It not only produces the irritation that the traditional tear gases produce, but it also produces inflammation upon contact. So when it comes in contact with the eyes, it not only causes the acclimation and the tearing, but it also causes inflammation. So even if you were under the influence of these substances, you literally couldn't fight through the pain and or the swelling, the involuntary closure of the eyes to see the individual or the officer that was arresting you. And you can wash it right off as environmentally benign. In fact, OC, you can eat. You can spray it right on your burrito and use it as a spice because that's what it is. It's cayenne peppers. Pepper spray is also available commercially. Companies like Defense Technology Federal Laboratories produce small aerosol canisters of OC spray that may be purchased and used without a license. Recently, a company in San Diego Pepperball Technologies introduced an effective way to deliver a dose of OC both to individuals and large crowds. Fired from a supercharged paintball gun, the Pepperball is a hard but breakable plastic sphere packed with three grams of OC powder. When the round hits the subject and breaks, it explodes that cloud of powder into the air in about a two foot diameter it gets in the face and the eyes of the suspect and acts basically as if they were just sprayed with an officer's pepper spray canister. And the pepper ball packs a serious wallet. When you get struck by this, it's, it's much like getting slapped very hard in the face. There's a real severe stinging sensation. In a lot of cases, it takes the brain about a second to a second and a half to actually register the pain. So you can put multiple hits on a subject and have before he actually his brain has a chance to to react to that but once it it does uh, the, the body basically says that hurts and I'm gonna stop what I'm doing in riot scenarios officers armed with pepper ball guns can either pinpoint agitators with single rounds or fire multiple balls at the ground to produce an OC cloud technology recently proved its effectiveness against an unruly crowd at the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics. There were a crowd of over 2,000 the last night of the Olympics and Pepperball with just about six launchers deployed was able to move that crowd 8 to 12 blocks and break them apart in about 10 to 15 minutes. The interesting thing though is that despite uh, the high profile of these types of events in the riot control, we found that about 95% of our deployments are actually in one-on-one -on -one situations, uh, preventing suicide by cop situations, um, mentally disturbed people who are causing trouble or maybe wielding a weapon, uh, and being able to bring them into compliance or, or stopping domestic violence. Pepperball Technologies produces over one million rounds per year, which make their way to police agencies and embassy security forces around the world. At present, the technology is available only to these types of official organizations. While chemical weapons such as pepper ball and OC spray force a criminal into submission by attacking his respiratory system, another group of non-lethal devices can thwart a wrongdoer by overwhelming the senses. weapons of light and sound, and their surprise and shock are critical elements in any successful battle strategy. From the inception of gunpowder, attackers have used the flash and roar of tactical explosions to paralyze their enemies. The conquistadors used the flash and the bang of the musket to great effect when fighting, say, the Aztecs or the Maya Indians. In 1805, the startling explosive effects of early rockets, like the British Congreve rocket, would terrorize even Napoleon's army, especially its horses. They could scare the horses, but against green troops who had never seen anything like this, they could have an effect too, because they made a hellacious noise, and it was a sound unlike any other on the battlefield. Both peacekeeping troops and police today often use small explosions as distractions to cover their movements. A tried and true method of delivering these surprises is the flashbang grenade. 
It produces blinding light and deafening noise, but no shrapnel. What it does, it goes off with about, uh, depending on the manufacturer now, uh, anywhere from three to seven million candle power and a bang of about 175 to 185 decibels. To give you an idea how bright, how loud, and so forth, three million candle power is enough to constrict your pupils through closed eyelids. A headlight on bright is about 100,000 candle power. How loud? 175 decibels is about four times as loud as a shotgun at the muzzle. Tossed into a room with a hostage taker, the flashbang grenade can completely overload the outlaw's senses. This sensory overload causes the, the body just to say, I've got to process information. And it creates this thing called an exploitation window. And this exploitation window lasts between two and eight seconds. During that time, the body is, is, does not have an effective response. In two to eight seconds, you can put a full entry team through a door. But while the flashbang grenade can be extraordinarily effective, not all shock weapons rely on explosions. Less spectacular, but no less useful devices are handheld super-powered flashlights called laser dazzlers. A dazzler channels low-intensity infrared light through a series of prisms, making the light both green in color, the human eye is more sensitive to green, and 6,000 times brighter. The idea is, is that it inhibits the suspect's ability to see, and obviously 85% of all the information that you use to relate to your everyday life is through your visual. And because of that, to the degree that we can inhibit an adversary's ability to process information or process it effectively, it inhibits his ability to defy our will. An overload of sound is another way to inhibit an adversary. And it's not confined to the startling acoustic effects of explosions. Perhaps if you've been to a, a concert and stood next to a speaker, you can feel the sound waves. You can feel that affect your body. If you amplify the power enough, it will make people feel uncomfortable, and it will begin to overwhelm one of their senses, in this case, their hearing. So now, if one of your senses is not working correctly, not working well, for that short period of time that you use the system, now they can't carry out their threat, what they want to do to you. The military is experimenting with a weapon that would deliver what amounts to a sonic bullet. Intense acoustic waves focused into a narrow beam. But the technology still has a few wrinkles. The problem that we look at from the human effects standpoint is, what if an unintended victim walks in front of the beam halfway to the person that you're targeting? What's that sound going to do to them? Is it going to be double the intensity or, or even more so? Those, those are the concerns that we have when we look at a system like that. But possibly the most intriguing non-lethal weapon that puts a beam of energy to use is ADT, Active Denial Technology. ADT uses millimeter waves, electromagnetic energy, to project a focused beam of heat. When this energy is applied to the body, it effect only goes in about 1 64th of an inch on the skin. And what it does is it, it, makes, it gives you a very strong sensation of warmth and heat. It's as if you just had an oven door open right in front of you, and your immediate reaction is to step or turn away. So again, one of your senses is now being overwhelmed, you're distracted, and you can't carry out that threat that you were going to against U.S. forces as easily as you originally intended. While it will typically be vehicle-mounted for use against crowds, ADT might also be installed in permanent locations to protect areas or buildings against intruders. You could set up a beam right adjacent to a perimeter fence such that for someone to come in and try and cut through the fence, they'd have to stand in the beam. And from what we've seen through uh, the volunteer test subjects, you don't want to stand in that beam for more than a second or, and a half or so. Weapons that overwhelm a person's senses may be quite effective against adversaries on foot. But when the troublemakers climb into vehicles, authorities must draw on still another area of the non-lethal arsenal. Weapons that disable machines and equipment. The laser. An intense and highly concentrated beam of light. 
for some uses, quite possibly the ultimate non-lethal weapon. While lasers have existed since the 1960s, only in recent years has the technology matured to the point of practical use. And military non-lethal weapons developers want to harness that technology for use in something called mission kill. It's a term strategists use to describe disabling an enemy's control systems and weapons machinery. If you render the enemy's machinery inoperable, you kill his mission without necessarily having to kill him. In some cases, you just want to immobilize a unit or you want to immobilize their equipment or just prevent it from working as effectively for a limited period of time. The goal is not always to destroy something. The laser, many feel, might be the perfect instrument for this approach. A laser, one actually capable of destruction, would allow for a very precise application of force. For example, if you found a rocket launcher, and with a laser, potentially, if you could just shoot the wings off of it so it can't fly, you don't have to now drop a 2,000-pound bomb to destroy the whole vehicle and the whole rocket launcher with all that collateral damage. If you can just precisely damage the right piece of that vehicle or that rocket, you've achieved the same thing. The laser isn't the only device capable of non-lethal mission kill. Another high-tech weapon being developed for this purpose is the electromagnetic pulse munition. Designed to be delivered by cruise missiles like the Navy's Tomahawk, this bomb releases an intensely powerful surge of electromagnetic energy. The concept originated from nuclear testing conducted by the Navy in the early 1960s. They found out that a nuclear weapon releases not only the normal things you think of, 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 of light and heat, but it also releases uh, electromagnetic pulse, EMP. An EMP, that electromagnetic pulse, will fry circuits. EMP was less of a threat in the 1960s because most electronics were still based on relatively sturdy vacuum tube technology. But when we went to things like transistors and silicon chips, that EMP would literally eat those things up. When a missile carrying an EMP munition nears its target, the munition generates an electromagnetic field and then explodes. The energy of the explosion then transfers to the electromagnetic field, increasing its size and power. A lot of military equipment has chips, and because it has these chips in it, you get a big pulse of electromagnetic energy into them. It will overload the circuits, they will shut down, and that piece of equipment is in fact dead. Civilian law enforcement also has a need for a form of mission kill technology. But the machines police usually want to kill are fleeing automobiles. Cars speeding from police endanger innocent lives. Anything that would stop vehicles is appealing to us right now. One prototype system is J4 Technologies Auto Arrester. This system is rolled out flat across the roadway in front of a fleeing vehicle. When the suspect car approaches, police activate the auto arrester, which emits a burst of electricity, shorting out the car's control system and bringing the vehicle to a stop. Another system, one developed by the military, attempts to stop vehicles by entangling them in a web of netting. It looks like a speed bump that you'd see in any parking lot. But when activated, within two seconds, a portable barrier pops up that it will stop a vehicle driving 45 miles an hour and fairly heavily loaded, about 7,500 pounds. But both vehicle stoppers have the same fundamental weakness. But the problem is, is that they're really only going to be useful in law enforcement at places that are going to be naturally constricted. Border checkpoints, uh, driveways, alleys and intersections and so forth. On the open roadway, a savvy driver might find a way to avoid the trap. What police really hope for is the sort of futuristic ray gun that could zap a fleeing vehicle, short out its electronics, 
and bring it to a stop under any circumstances. Scientists are working towards such a weapon, but at present, a serviceable prototype is still merely a distant goal. Whether for use in mission kill or riot control, some fear that non-lethal weapons could present a danger in themselves, that authorities might use them too readily. And since many of these devices can be lethal, if used inappropriately, that they may end up causing more serious injuries than they prevent. But for those who rely on them, their benefits far outweigh their risks. If we have a man with a knife that's threatened to kill us, and the only way we have to intervene is with, with a gun, then if we try it with a beanbag and we seriously hurt him, that'd save his life. We would consider that a success. Take that away from us. You forced us to go to the next option available, which is lethal force. And as a result of that, you virtually condemn this man because we will survive this contact. You, we cannot ask our deputies to go in there and give up their lives to, to save this one. And since saving lives is what police work should really be about, any attempt to stop criminals without killing them is a step forward. As the tragedy in that Moscow theater painfully illustrated, non-lethal weapons are certainly not infallible. But many of these new technologies can offer at least the potential for dealing with violent behavior in a more humane and less fatal manner.